Hi, I'm James Brundage, and welcome to Game Breaking PowerShell, where I'm going to try to blow your mind as much as possible in the next 45 minutes or so. Before we get to that, brief introduction. As said, I'm James Brundage with Start Automating. Uh, I've been uh, scripting PowerShell for about 15 years now. I was on the PowerShell team for about four years, and uh, I've been a PowerShell consultant for about 11 years now. I make a lot of useful tools and interesting toys in PowerShell. It's a rewarding living. I treat programming in PowerShell as a very satisfying game. I try to have a lot of fun with it, and I keep at it for the love of that particular game. So, before we break any games, we should kind of get to what they're officially called. Well, the game of PowerShell, at least officially, is, and this is According to marketing text, PowerShell is a cross-platform task automation and configuration management framework consisting of a command line, shell, and scripting language. Hmm. This sounds like a boring game. That's not really the way I think of it, though, and I don't think that's the way most of you think of it, hopefully. Unofficially, PowerShell's game is convert raw resources into easy building blocks, build cool things with those blocks, and then beat other programming languages at their own game. So let's take a look at how PowerShell gets to do that. See, PowerShell is a unique modular cross-platform programming language. It is incredibly flexible. By contrast, most programming languages are very, very rigid. Uh, PowerShell already breaks a lot of the game of programming because you don't have to repeat yourself as near as, near as much and because you can easily bind and convert from one thing to another. Let's learn how we can actually break the game of PowerShell a notch further and by extension do even more cool stuff with PowerShell and programming. Step one, let's break with verb, noun, verbosity. Now, verb noun naming is a unique convention of PowerShell with a very great intention. In theory, if the world used standardized verbs, it would be really easy to find functionality. However, in practice, lots of functionality ends up spread across very few verbs. There's lots of gets, there's lots of invokes, there's a few adds, there's a few removes, and there's... I don't know, 90 other verbs that most people barely ever know about. And in practice, non-PowerShell users find this kind of confusing, uh, and dare I say a little off-putting. It is something that is kind of a common refrain from non-PowerShell users. Why can't I just, you know, have A space B space C, or have kill instead of stop? So it creates a barrier to entry where we don't actually need to have one. And it also limits PowerShell's elegance to only be verb noun oriented. There's a lot of things that you might want to express or kind of pseudo extensions of the language that you would want to add in that just don't really make sense as a verb noun pair. Good thing this is not a hard limit. So let's see how we can name break. So again, PowerShell is a very, very flexible language. Commands can be named almost anything. And I really kind of only have the asterisk because there's certain limits on what you can easily access. There are very few on what you can technically name. These command names that we're about to see, they're all technically legal, although they're not ones you're probably used to seeing this would be legal. You can have a command name be a URL. It's not always as nice to tab complete. Uh, in particular, the colon and slash tend to throw tab completion off quite a bit, but that is a legal command name. You can have that return data. Have fun. You can also have something that looks kind of like a regular expression capture um, with the question and uh, less than and greater than and a description text in the middle. You can also go really primitive, just kind of a couple of bits of punctuation. Um, this effectively lets you add pseudo-operators. 
and you can also have keywords really short little you know one word things again technically you can also have multi word commands it's just a little bit more of a pain to invoke them so what's not legal again it it's really kind of more a matter of how hard it is not what you can't do but curly braces and parentheses cannot easily be declared all of the things that I kind of listed above you could have function that and that would be legal it would not complain curly braces you would have to declare using the function provider punctuation used in operators can't be used to start a command again at least one you want to run interactively so while I could kind of go through a hop skip and a jump to declare a command name something like minus minus well it wouldn't really be that useful so that sort of things out but aside from that you know there's a lot you can do this quirk of PowerShell lets functionality be grouped a lot more differently than just simple verb noun pairing you can do all sorts of different things with a good naming convention let's see how it's done and see how it's helpful the trick that I tend to use is what I call smart aliasing and just in case you have no idea what it is it's when you create multiple aliases to a single command and use the name of the caller to change functionality kinda of fun trick the name of the caller is going to be in dollar my invocation dot invocation name at least under most circumstances if you call the or with use the call operators dot or and then that'll be in my invocation dot line and you'll have to do a little bit of parsing to find out what you were called you can also add dynamic parameters for a lot more dynamic functionality so you could map a particular name to a script on disk and inherit those that scripts parameter or you could take a particular URL and map out the parameters for that URL or take a regular expression and have some parameters for how you generate it you know you can go on and add infinitum that's the point this is a really great way to surface a suite of similar functionality without rewriting code because you really only write the one command and you think about how your naming convention feeds into that command and how the metadata that you feed into that works so let's see it in action. In particular, I'm going to show you a module called Irregular. It's making regular expressions strangely simple. There is also a lightning round talk on this if you'd like to check it out. And there was a talk at the New York City uh, PowerShell user group uh, earlier this month that is online. You can check it out on YouTube. So over the years, I've gotten pretty good at regular expressions, which is kind of horrible to admit it's kind of feels like it should have a 12-step program complex regex is a very large pain in the app well pain to write and an equal pain to reuse so a while ago I set out to solve both of these problems making regular expressions a lot easier to write and making them a lot easier to reuse and smart aliasing was kind of a key part of how I approached that Irregular helps me write regular expressions and provides a useful and growing library of built-in regular expressions. At this point, a little over 80, I believe. It's very extensible and embeddable. You can go ahead and drop in your own little regex folder full of your own regexes, and you can use it to write your own regexes and export regexes from it. But it also uses a lot of the whole name breaking convention trick and we're going to kind of focus on that so let's go ahead and take a quick tour all right let's take a quick tour of a regular first let's see some traditional powershell syntax and go ahead and get the regexes that are available there are about 80 in the box but i can go ahead and pipe that to measure object there are 81 right now this grows fairly routinely I'm just going to go ahead and fly through some of the interesting uses of it. I'm going to go ahead and start by getting the files underneath the regular. 
there are two types of regular expressions that you can kind of work with in a regular. One is just a plain old simple regex. Uh, the other one is a regex generator that will actually look at the surrounding context and take additional parameters. So multi-line comment is that latter one and I can actually use that to find all comments within all files across various languages. I can also go ahead and quickly see what files require stuff. So that's nice and easy. Uh, this is another example of a generator here. And again, I'm taking dynamic parameters defined in the PS1 here, and I'm actually making that part of the syntax. So I can go ahead and find all examples. Nice, simple, elegant. I can also go look for email addresses. I'm not sure why I'd find any, but oh yeah, I probably have one in tests. Uh, let's double check that that's what's going on. Yeah, it's in tests. I'm fine. I'm, I'm good with this. All right. I can also sometimes pass a bit of a regular expression to one of these generators and kind of open up a bit more possibility. So I can go find all the examples, synopses, or descriptions within all the files. I can also do such fun things as use generic balancing expressions, like balance brackets. Oh, by the way, if I emit a regular expression here, I'll get to see a nice colorized form of this in any other host than the ISE because regular expressions are real objects and they can be formatted. PowerShell is a beautiful language. So I can go ahead and find all the balanced brackets within all the PS1 files. Quite a few there. I could run the other two, but it would take longer. I'll go move some, to something a little bit more cool. I'm in a directory that has a repository. I've got a regex that will actually allow me to parse out git logs. I have to actually wrap them all up into one big string. That's this part here first. But there you go. There's all the commit logs. It's quite a few. I kind of want to make that a little bit simpler and turn that into something more useful as an object. So I'm going to go ahead and select object there with dash extract, and that's a parameter that's available for any one of the regexes. There are plenty of other ones, splits and replace, and where are objects. It's a fun module. Go check it out. The point of it is, though, with smart aliasing, you can actually break PowerShell syntax wide open and do interesting stuff. And uh, sorry if you watched the lightning round first, but if you haven't, uh, I We'll go ahead and quickly show regexception here. And regexception is simply the ability to extract linked data, which is embedded in most web pages to make them CO friendly out from a given website. So in this case, I'm going to IMDb. I've extracted data out about a particular movie. Uh, what movie name? Oh, that, that fits. Let's see if they have something that makes some degree of sense as a description. Uh, about as much sense as Inception. Okay, so that's a regular. It's a fun little weird module, and it kind of starts to break open PowerShell syntax with smart aliasing. There are lots of different regexes for you to use. Come back to it whenever you'd like. Have fun. The point of it here is you can actually take a whole area of PowerShell and expose it very simply and elegantly with a good domain-specific syntax. All right, so that's one down. You are well, hopefully ready for a few more? All right, so that was a regular, and that's how you expose a whole domain-specific language to PowerShell through just one command. Now let's go ahead and take a look at how we can kind of break open command metadata and the object pipeline. Let's splat it all together. A very common misconception about PowerShell is that you need to know what's next in the pipeline, that is, what command you're about to run. You you really don't. Um, it's 
much more flexible of a language than most people expect it to be. And the key to this is splatting. And for those that are uninitiated, it's a PowerShell feature that allows you to pass structured arguments to any given command. It's commonly used to pass parameters down and around using PS bound parameters, which is an automatic variable that is populated at any given function level containing the bound parameters. This works, but you have to strip away useless parameters first. So if I'm piping command A to command B and they don't have exactly the same parameters, it becomes kind of tedious. However, PowerShell commands have a lot of metadata that we can work with, and this actually can allow us to kind of solve this problem. We can filter what we can splat. This is really repeatable, really tedious code, but using it appropriately allows you to have commands that are eminently pluggable. Once you're done, you can basically make any command overloadable and extensible. So I can say this command takes this sort of signature or will be passed to any given command that meets these parameters. It's a very fun approach. And I, of course, you know, being a PowerShell geek, wrote a module to make it all work. That module, that's splatter. Simple scripts to supercharge splatting. Please don't say that five times fast. It is a small PowerShell module. It allows you to have all sorts of fun with splatting. And I do mean small. I believe it's less than 30 kilobytes uh, if you directly include it. Get splat, which is alias to question at, turns any input object into valid arguments for any command or script block. So I can just throw stuff at the wall and see if it works. Find splat question question at will find possible commands and arguments given an input. So I can basically say, hey, I've got a little bit of data. What could possibly work with this data? Use splat will run that input against one or more commands, and that's dot splat. And particularly interesting is use splat dash stream, which will actually pipe to multiple commands, so you can have a split pipeline going to n number of commands at a given step. Merge splat, star splat, of course, will help you combine dictionaries and property bags. Oh, I guess I should kind of underline this part. You can now pipe any object in and have it turned into a hash table for command input. So it doesn't have to be a hash table going in, it can come from anywhere. It's a really handy little module. Uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at it. All right, so let's get started with Splatter for a second. I'll go ahead and re-import the module and go ahead and get all commands from that. There are actually a few more than were listed on the previous slide. We'll come back to Outsplat in particular in a second. Uh, let's get into a bit of a demo mode. So if I go ahead and say this, pipe to get process normally, no bueno. It does not work. Uh, that's partially because this isn't a real object yet, and partially because not all parameters will always be nice with the pipeline. Uh, however, I can go ahead and say that at question or question at which is get splat get process and it will return me back yeah I can map this parameter here and then I can go pipe it to use splat and then run it I could also find things that could run this so I could run debug and stop and wait and get process good to know. In fact, actually, I can also see whether it could run, what parameters were missing, what percentage of input that I can map. Again, handy module. Uh, I can also throw in junk data and see that it gets filtered out. So in all these cases, junk data was unmapped. And that's really already handy enough in terms of ways that you can kind of change around PowerShell uh, just by being able to throw data around, but it does get a notch better in a couple of ways. 
Uh, way number one is that splatter is very embeddable. So I can go ahead and initialize splatter. And that will return me a direct form of all of the different commands in splatter defined in script blocks. So they're not going to pollute your module. You can kind of statically link a copy of splatter and be on your merry way. Uh, splatter does not change that often, um, but it does let your module do a lot of cool stuff. The other really fun example of cool stuff is being able to pipe to multiple things and being able to pipe dynamically to script blocks. So here I've set up a little bit of data. There's you know, a couple people and I'm going to run a few different commands. In this case, a few different dynamic scripts. This one takes a name from the pipeline, that one takes age from the pipeline, that one takes city and state, and some of them do different stuff in the process, some of them do stuff in the process again, a couple of them put a summary object at the end, and let's just go ahead and run it. Sorry for the debugger slowness there. Let's scroll up, see what our output looked like, or here, rerun without that. Okay, so got my first piece of information, age, location output, second piece of information, age, location output. So the object pipeline is piping to command one and command two. Well, actually, command one, command two, command three, command one, command two, command three, then command two is hitting its end block and then command three is hitting its end block. Next up on our crazy joyride through PowerShell is going to be scripting asynchronously. It's a pretty common misconception that uh, PowerShell has to run synchronously. That is, you have to start at point A and end at point B or go from top to bottom of the script. This isn't true either. Uh, it's actually not been true for some time. PowerShell's had a whole subsystem for events that most of us have never used since all the way back in PowerShell version 2. Uh, in case you need a bit of a refresher, just to start off, new event will broadcast events to the run space. They can also be forwarded out to other run spaces. They can have message data, they can have a sender, they can have event arguments, so you can actually pack a few pieces of information along with them. They also have a built-in timestamp, so these events and their data can act as an efficient multi-channel in-memory log. That's already really great, considering how many people have driven themselves kind of nuts writing logging in PowerShell. Uh, but even better than that, you can actually hook any of those events with register edge and event. You can also put this together with register object event, which will hook regular .NET objects and their events, and you can script quite a lot asynchronously. It's unfortunately a little awkward in its naming, even by you know PowerShell standards. Those uh, register object event and register ed engine event are both well a mouthful, not particularly easy to remember and figuring out exactly what things that you wanted to kind of hook up an event to, well, that's that's a little bit of a trick. So, you know, as usual, I wanted to kind of expose it in a way that was a little bit more elegant. Say it with me here. Go ahead and make a PowerShell module. In this case, the module is called OnQ, Easy Asynchronous Event Driven Scripting. This is the youngest of the modules we're demonstrating today, so you know, take it with a grain of salt, file issues if you got them. It is a module that makes event-driven scripting easier. It adds a few new members to the dash event commands list. You can receive events, which is alias to receive, and this is slightly more flexible than get event. Uh, it's a little bit better at filtering out stuff ahead of time and allowing you to return a particular count. There's also send event, which is alias to send, and it's pretty simple. It's a wrapper for new event, 
but it provides pipelining support, so you can pipe a bunch of objects into it, which you can't do with new event, and it doesn't actually output to the pipeline, so you don't have to suppress its output, which is handy. And it's aliased again to send. And then there's watch event. Well, this is the main event, the big function, and it's aliased to on. It also has a number of smart aliases for a number of built-in event sources. It uh, allows this sort of, you know, code format on delay, time span, thing to do. If you wanted to kind of list this in a more explicit form, each event source will get a smart alias of its own. So I could say something like on at file change, then output whatever happened whenever the event name was created. And an event source can exist in any module manifest. So in addition to the events that come with on queue, you could actually have any command in any module produce events and have it easily hook up into this ecosystem. Let's go ahead and take a quick tour. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at some basic syntax here. On again is an alias to watch event. My signal is the name of a source identifier. I can either use an arbitrary event source, which will return a source identifier to me, or I can give it a source identifier of any event that I choose. And here I'm going to go write a message to the host whenever I get an event. In this case, I'm going to say fire and include the message data. Dollar event is an automatic variable built into PowerShell events that, well, contains the event. So let's go ahead and run that real quick. All right, now it's all set up. And let's go ahead and use the old school new event to write out a couple of events and see that PowerShell is asynchronous and, well, get a sense of why we wanted to build something a notch better. Okay, so there are the two events. Uh, there's the actual event object that is generated, which I really don't want in my output, as I mentioned earlier. And there's the event handler, and then there's the next event, and then there's the next events handler. Now, to make this a little bit more succinct and enable pipelining, I've created send event alias to send, so I can write this nice little short syntax, and away we go. And obviously, I can send more than you know three events into there, so no problem. Now, I've alluded to event sources being a thing. Uh, you can obviously go and discover them. You can use get event source to do that. Uh, it provides this nice colorized formatter, and the colorized formatter will also include the name of the event source, the synopsis, which is basically built in from PowerShell help, and the parameters. Uh, this makes it easier for you to find out what's there and available, and if any modules were to expose an event source, it makes it easy for you to find out what they do. I'm going to go ahead and use the on delay one real quick, and I'm just going to go run in a second. Clear the screen. And the one, and a, there we are. So nice, simple asynchronous scripting. I can also have something run on an interval, and empty then will generate an event, but in this case I'm going to actually use this to go send another event every minute. We'll check in on that later. One thing that's really cool is that you can kind of build events out of nothing. Uh, so on module change will actually go check when there are new modules by polling what modules are loaded and informing you when new ones show up. So I'm going to go ahead and hook that event there and then I'm going to go import good old irregular and this has a relatively low polling frequency by default so it'll take a couple seconds for it to show up. I think it's five or six. So we'll just let that do its thing. Oh, there it is. So I had a module loaded. That was the name of the module loaded. Nice, easy, workable. I can write scripts that actually respond to a module load now. I've only wanted to do that for eh, a decade. 
I don't know if anybody else is wanting to do that, but if you do, now you have a way to get there. Getting more interesting, I can also have something that runs when other scripts finish. So I'm going to go run this kind of arbitrary sleeper script here, which is going to emit its data when it's done. So it shouldn't take that long. Just give it a second. There it goes. Getting a few notches crazier and cooler, one of the other things that we can also do is hook variable sets. Again, that's something I've wanted to do in PowerShell for quite a while. I technically could do it with the debugger. This gives me a way to actually take the breakpoint in the debugger and send out data instead of actually break. Um, so what this will do is actually generate an event every time the variable is changed and the center of that event will be the call stack in which it changed. So I'm going to go ahead and change this variable a bunch. And I'm going to use the built-in get event for a second just to kind of see. Alright, there's my variable sets. And then I'm going to show off receive event which gives you something that I've also wanted in get event for a while a first. So oh, one other thing to kind of note is receive events returns events in the right order, get event returns events uh, earliest first, uh, treating them like a well queue, um, receive events gets the most recent event first, treating them like a, a stack. So this is a lot more effective to work with. This is a fairly new module, it's uh, going to be kind of expanding fairly rapidly as I find more interesting things that I want to build event sources around, and it's functionality that I intend to integrate through a number of modules. It's also something that I will shortly be making embeddable in the same sort of way as Splatter is embeddable. So that's on cue, and that's how we can script asynchronously. So that's event-driven scripting. Let's move on to something a little bit more practical. Uh, still game breaking, but the sort of game we all play almost every day of our PowerShell lives, and that's rapid restful development. Nowadays, everybody needs some rest. You have rest services that you need to work with all the time in PowerShell. Luckily, it's already easy enough to write a restful command. In case you're not aware, invoke rest method is generally speaking your friend. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a tedious friend because you have to copy, paste, find, and replace the logic that will actually take parameters to your function and turn them into parameters to the RESTful API. It would be nice if there were a uniform way to kind of make this easier and, well, you know, break the game a bit. We can make this process shorter by combining some of the tricks we've already learned. A bit of the regex can be used to pick apart the URL format commonly found in documentation or in an open API specification. There are a few different forms found, but they're almost all incorporated in the expression already built into a regular rest underscore variable. This can be embedded once within a given module or a given command, so you can kind of have a core invocation base to build on top of. And this handles most of the problems of getting the variables into the URL. This leaves us with the general problem of how we actually map all the URLs out to given commands and expose them all. We have a couple approaches we can take here. The brutish one, but effective, is to use smart aliasing. And we can actually create aliases for any given endpoint. That's great, it works, it's nice from a exposure perspective, but it's not very PowerShell-y. The smarter and more flexible way to do this is with parameter sets. Uh, this is a huge trick in PowerShell to be aware of. You can have parameter sets be very complicated. Um, they can have all sorts of information. In this case, they can have embedded RESTful URL segments. Now, there's a module that I've got that uses both of these tricks, and we're going to go take a quick look at it. It's PS DevOps. So let's take a quick look. Alright, 
Well, PS DevOps is a pretty decently sized project. It covers a lot of different REST APIs, but I'm not trying to spend a lot of time covering it. I'm covering its tricks. This one function is probably one of the better examples of it just because it has so many parameter sets to speak of. Get ADO build does, I think at last count, 19 different things. And as we kind of scroll through, it should be kind of clear how this works, or at least a little bit of it. So what we have here are just a few standard parameters that are kind of global. And then as we start to get into individual parameters that are keyed, something like build ID, you have a parameter set that has most of the RESTful endpoint within it. And I can repeat this as many times as I can kind of uniquely bind parameters. Um, I can put basically as many endpoints within a single command as I'd like. This one again has, I think, 19. This is a really useful technique for rapidly building out REST. It defines most of the metadata up here, and while well, I have about, you know, what, let's see, 250 lines of parameter declaration, I don't really have anywhere near that much in terms of actual implementation, and this is actually a fairly complicated inner implementation. But basically what goes on here is that you grab whatever parameters would work for a core invoker, create a collection of objects as you pipe in, maybe nudge parameter sets if you need to, and queue them, and in the end, go unroll the collection and do whatever calls you needed to do. Which ones doesn't really matter, this just will apply the different RESTful variables or query parameters required. So again, really simple, big, flexible, open and trick. That's the nice, flexible, complete author choice way to do it. If you wanted to be considerably lazier, uh, well, you can also just go ahead and get a bunch of RESTful paths and endpoints automatically defined into commands. And that's what this connect GitHub will do. So connect GitHub help will give me a number of built-in commands that take the form api.github.com slash endpoint. So I'm going to go get some Zen here. A little bit more Zen. Great. This gives me a way that I can do some degree of tab completion, but unfortunately tab completion is not really always your friend once slashes are involved, but I can easily flip through the entire GitHub REST API and see all the different endpoints available to me. So this is nifty. Uh, I think my favorite little example of what I can do with this so far is I can go ahead and get the licenses. Let's go ahead and get command api.github.com slash license all right, so let's take that command there, which will return me a list of valid licenses. And I've gone and created a types file that defines an alias here of license to the key. And then I can go ahead and automatically pipe that command to get details on each license. So again, really simple, flexible approach. Um, using this, it's possible to basically talk to any REST API without implementing anything more than kind of a core common invoker. And if you wanted to have ultimate flexibility, you can write the parameter sets. And if you want to just be lazy, you can just alias a bunch of URLs and call it good. Uh, one more thing before we kind of finish up here is that I can also use a bit of a regular to go discover what parameter sets exist. There's the PowerShell parameter set regular expression that I can use. So I can actually go get everything in PS DevOps, get the module root, split the path out, get the files underneath that that might contain a function find the parameter sets, extract them out as property bags, expand out the property parameter set name, and return the unique objects. 
and there we go. And for PowerShell bonus points, I can sort it, of course, and measure it. Ain't the object pipeline grand. So this is a great simple way to basically get your work done a lot easier by exposing a lot more REST APIs in a lot less time. So that was a short example of some rapid RESTful development techniques in PowerShell. Considering that those are more business, I'd like to end on something a little bit more pleasurable. Breaking games by making games. So we've covered a lot of different tools and techniques. I'd like to talk through something a lot more frivolous, and that is console games. And I, I mean that literally in the PowerShell dad joke sort of way, like games for a console. Jokes aside, though, game development does have a lot of interesting challenges. How does any given game handle input? How do you manage the game's world? Like, how is it declared in the first place? More importantly, how do you allow things in that world to interact without defining a thing too rigidly? PowerShell is up to this challenge, too. I kind of got it in my head, uh, early on in COVID times to go and see if I could tackle the space and came out with something kind of fun. That is Power Arcade, a retro arcade game console in PowerShell. Last April 1st, I released this fun functional joke. Games are housed within a given module and that module doesn't need any given commands. The game will use some special subdirectories. Game, levels, and sprites. Game defines the game logic. Levels will define logic within a specific level and will kind of inherit some of the game state as well. And sprites are things that move about the screen. The name of directory.ps1 is used to initialize games, levels, or sprites. So if I have a level called 1, then 1.ps1 is run when level 1 is loaded. Name of directory.psd1 is used to provide initial data for a game level sprite. You can think of the PS1 as something kind of like a constructor, and the PSD1 as kind of a set of initial properties. Games and levels can have key handlers defined in onKey.ps1, which will handle all key presses, or onKey specific key.ps1, which will handle a specific key press. Other PS1 files in a given directory will become script methods of the given game, level, or sprite. So using this, you can very flexibly define a game world in a very small amount of code. Now, uh, this has been a fun functional joke, and I'm not trying to you know, make Call of Duty in this, uh, but just to kind of give you a sense of how this all works and have a little bit of fun, let's play around a bit. Before we play a game, a brief tour of the module. So it's Power Arcade here, and I can go ahead and check out how nice and small it is. A bunch of it is formatting. There's a few commands related to sprites, a few commands to initialize levels and games. And believe it or not, there's actually a built-in ability to have a game store built on top of the PowerShell module or, uh, gallery. So I can find games that are listed on the gallery, I can get games that are pre-installed, and, well, let's get to playing. I start a game with the start game command, appropriately. Uh, game path can either be a short name of a game or a full path to a module containing a game. In this case, I'm going to load up a PowerShell port of a very old QBasic game called Nibbles uh, that was built into Windows PCs prior to 3.1. Uh, it's a fun little game where you eat particular numbers and watch your score grow and your tail grow and you try to avoid it. It's kind of a little Tron-like cycle. Uh, there's the classic levels that are built in and there's also an endless mode that has been kind of extended as part of building this out. Here's one of the classic modes. Number ended up a little bit further away than I'd like. The game is structurally incredibly simple. Essentially, the thing that you've got moving around here now is the snake. 
uh, the number is another sprite that it interacts with, and the wall is the third sprite that you have going. And whenever a snake hits anything that is not a number, it dies. So if I eat the number, my tail gets longer, but if I do something stupid like run into a wall, well, game over, man. At least, life over, man. Do that five times, then it's game over, man. Three, two, one. Just to show off one more thing, here's the endless mode. This will procedurally generate a level with random spots and go ahead and pop up new obstacles whenever you end up hitting a particular number. It's not the world's most complicated game, but that's kind of the point. It was really easy and fun to write, and uh, quite a simple little framework to build on top of if you wanted to go ahead and write your own. Since you'd probably rather learn that framework than watch me play a game that, I don't know, might look a little dated, we'll go ahead and stop in a second and do that, just after I get that next number. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's gaming. You got you gotta, right? All right, here's our module for Nibbles 2020. The first thing you might notice is that there's not a PSM one, just a PSD one. The core of the game is in these three subdirectories, game, levels, and sprites. Uh, the sprites here are most of the logic. The snake is the kind of most important one. These plus files indicate interactivity, so this is whenever the snake collides with anything. This is when snake collides with number. This is when it collides with a wall, tail, or a snake. So let's go check out that one. Oh, what happens when it hits anything? It dies. How does that work? It calls the dies method, which is implemented in the same directory in dies.ps1. It'll go check the name of the snake, decrement its lives, go to game over if it doesn't have any left, and restart the level if it does have some left. The individual number and wall sprites are also defined in a PSD one inside of their own directories, just basically saying what color I want to render them in, and optionally some content that they're going to display. And that's almost entirely it. I mean, aside from a very small amount of code to lay out each level. Let's take a really quick look at one of those before I give something that might be a little bit more of 21st century. Uh, so let's see here. Let's go take a look at level one. Level one just goes and adds the snake at a random spot. Somewhere between five-eighths of the game's width and half the game's height. I'm going in a particular fixed direction. And it adds a number anywhere. And that's that. To show you a glimpse of the future beyond ASCII art, I have five magic words for you pixel shaders in Windows Terminal. Yeah, we're gonna be able to do about whatever kind of game we want with that. So, that's enough fun for one day, I think. What's next? Well, I'm always looking for new and interesting ways to break the game and extend the PowerShell language. If you've got any fun ideas or interesting projects, go ahead and reach out. You can sometimes reach me on Twitter, at James Brew very often on the PowerShell Discord at Start Automating. There's this old-fashioned thing called email you can also use, james.brundage at start-automating.com. And if you're interested in any of these projects, you can find them on my GitHub. So have fun, do interesting things with it, find your own ways to break the PowerShell game. I hope this is inspiring and shows you lots of cool things you can do with the PowerShell language that you didn't know before. Thanks very much. Have a good day.